Welcome to this week's Norse World Report. I'm Emily Sisk. Thanks for tuning in with us. Tonight, we'll take a look at the upcoming NCAA tournament and a few of its shining players, the severe storms that rocked the region on Tuesday, as well as entertainment and more. President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump claimed wins in another round of primaries on Tuesday. Although they've already secured their nominations, both teams were paying close attention to what voters had to say, especially in crucial battleground states like Wisconsin. Our Washington correspondent, Julia Benbrook, broke down the key takeaways from Tuesday's primary in the Badger State. All eyes were on Wisconsin yesterday. Its status as a crucial 2024 presidential battleground means that every vote was scrutinized for deeper meaning or some insight of what's to come in November. And some people there were looking to send a message with sizable shares of voters casting their ballots for someone or something other than Biden or Trump. Almost any path to victory will run through several swing states, including Wisconsin. Back in 2016, former President Donald Trump secured a win there by fewer than 23,000 votes. And then in 2020, President Joe Biden won by fewer than 21,000 votes. I came to office determined to uphold the duty that gets us through one of the toughest periods in our nation's history. And we have. Wisconsin primary voters are now sending both Biden and Trump a message. More than 47,000 Wisconsin Democrats, that's roughly 8% of those who went to the polls, marked uninstructed at the ballot box, largely in protest of Biden's handling of the war in Gaza. If they won't listen to our call or our emails or our letters, then they better listen to our votes instead. Trump also faced pushback as he continues to try and reach more moderate voters. A vote for Trump is a vote to save Wisconsin and is a vote to save your country. In Wisconsin, more than 76,000 Republicans, that's roughly 13 percent of those who voted, cast their ballots for his former primary opponent, Nikki Haley. Another former opponent, Ron DeSantis, and uninstructed, brought in about 30,000 votes combined. After some time away from the traditional campaign trail, Trump made a couple of key stops yesterday, one in Wisconsin and one in Michigan, another key state in November. Biden made a campaign swing of his own last month, visiting key battleground areas. Reporting at the White House, I'm Julia Benbrook. Presidential primaries will take place in Pennsylvania and Alabama over the weekend. We're just a few short days away from the total solar eclipse spanning across the country, but the weather may have other plans for eclipse viewers. Make sure you grab your eclipse glasses and maybe a raincoat on Monday. Severe thunderstorms could put a damper on eclipse watching taking place on April 8th. Parts of Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Louisiana could see damaging winds, hail, rain, and perhaps a tornado. There's a chance violent storms could hold off until late afternoon, just long enough for eclipse watchers to get a decent view of the phenomenon. But cloud coverage could still possibly obscure the sky. Plus, storms firing up later in the day could impact post-eclipse travel. Some NKU students will be traveling to Finley, Ohio to observe the eclipse in the path of totality. A massive deadly earthquake rocked across Taiwan's east coast early Wednesday, flattening buildings, trapping residents, and triggering mountain landslides. Emergency officials there say at least nine people have been killed and 934 injured. The island sits on what's known geologically as the Pacific Ring of Fire, which makes it prone to earthquakes. But as Laura Aguirre shows us, Wednesday's quake is the strongest to hit the island in a quarter century, with the threat of more aftershocks still possible. The early morning commute in Hualin County, Taiwan, shaken to a halt as a massive 7.4 magnitude earthquake rocked the island's eastern coast. This television studio and many buildings in the epicenter, a county of over 300,000 people, were left damaged or destroyed. Collapsing structures trapped people inside. Some were pulled to safety quickly, while frantic search and rescue efforts got underway to find others still known to be in the rubble or who were unaccounted for. Taiwan's National Fire Agency says some of the trapped are foreign nationals, as this mountainous region is popular with tourists, especially hikers. <laughs> Several dozen people, they add, are believed trapped in collapsed or blocked highway tunnels, with the threat of continued landslides looming. 
The U.S. Geological Survey recorded about 30 aftershocks greater than 4.0 magnitude in the hours after the initial quake and warns more could happen in the days ahead. As of early Wednesday, all but one hospital across Taipei City, the island's capital just over 90 miles away, were operating normally, despite suffering varying degrees of structural damage, say local officials. The number of injured estimated at over 900 people and could climb, as may the death toll. President Joe Biden is monitoring the rescue and recovery efforts, confirmed a National Security Council rep, and the U.S. is standing by to offer assistance. I'm Laura Aguirre reporting. Seven major earthquakes have hit Taiwan over the last 50 years. Prior to Wednesday, the most recent one was a 7.1 magnitude quake in 2006 in southern Taiwan. NCAA women's basketball has undoubtedly taken over the spotlight, and ticket prices are reflecting the country's interest in the upcoming Final Four matchup. Final Four ticket prices surged after Caitlin Clark's Iowa Hawkeyes beat the LSU Tigers. The wave of enthusiasm for Clark and her team pushed the average ticket price for the all-day women's Final Four in Cleveland to more than $2,600. The minimum price was just over $900, and the most expensive ticket for Friday's game is more than $11,000. And Clark's stardom isn't just impacting prices. More people are watching, too. 12.3 million viewers turned it, tuned in to the Iowa-LSU game, but at one point, 16.1 million were watching which is a ratings record for a women's college basketball game. Speaking of Clark and her sports stardom, the senior guard has been recognized for her record-breaking season at Iowa. 2024 Jersey Mike's Naismith Trophy for the most outstanding women's college basketball player. Caitlin Clark, University of Iowa. In the 2024 Jersey Mike's Naismith National Player of the Year for the second year in a row. Clark led the Hawkeyes to their second straight Final Four in the women's NCAA tournament for the second consecutive season. The 22-year-old will now lead the Hawkeyes against UConn this Friday night in the NCAA tournament. If the Hawkeyes win, the team will advance to the championship game, also for the second year in a row. Clark is also the only player in the NCAA men's or women's basketball history to lead her conference in scoring and assists in four consecutive seasons. Another women's basketball star has announced her plans for the future. Louisiana State University basketball star Angel Reese is leaving school for the WNBA. Reese posted the announcement on social media Wednesday. She also went into detail about her decision in a story in Vogue magazine, saying she's accomplished everything she wanted to in college sports and her ultimate goal is to be a pro. The WNBA draft is April 15th. Reese is projected to be a top 10 pick. The LSU Tigers were crowned the NCAA Women's Basketball National Champions last year after defeating Iowa. Now let's take it over to Rachel to see what's coming up in entertainment. Thank you, Emily. Tonight, I will give you the details on a new radio channel for Swifties, a film challenge aimed at making change and the selling of the image and likeness of a popular 1970s band. That and more when we come back. Foster care. I never knew when I would have to move. So I always had my suitcase ready to go. Then one day, I was adopted. My new parents opened their hearts and home to me. My parents cook my favorite breakfast for me every morning. My parents take me on trips I never thought I would go on. They gave me a home and an even better reason to use that suitcase. My parents aren't perfect, but they're perfect for me. I'm Jenny Garth. And as a mother of three, I know kids worry about a lot of things. Getting enough food to eat shouldn't be one of them. But here in America, that is a real worry for one in five children. This is unacceptable and something Feeding America is working to solve. Through a nationwide network of food banks, Feeding America serves virtually every community in the United States, including yours. See how you can help your community. Visit feedingamerica.org. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Dad? Just one minute, okay? Hey, Bobo, do trees tell each other stories? I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, why don't we go find out? Listen. Do clouds take naps? 
I couldn't tell you. Can birds draw pictures? I don't have an answer for that. Dad, do stars visit their friends? Look! Welcome to this week's Norse Media Entertainment Report. I'm Rachel Williams. Taylor Swift is temporarily getting a channel dedicated to her on Sirius XM. It will feature music spanning her 17-year career that includes Taylor's version, tracks, and live recordings. It will be on Channel 13, a nod to her famous lucky number. The channel on the subscription-based radio platform launches Sunday. Her new album, The Tortured Poets Department, drops on the 13th day of its run, which is April 19th. The channel will air around the clock across North America through May 6th. Movie and music news now. Here's David Daniel with today's Hollywood Minute. Open to filmmakers with and without disabilities who want to challenge how disabilities are viewed and inspire change. Teams around the U.S. and beyond have begun the 11th annual Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge. They have through Sunday to create short films aimed at changing the way the world defines disability. The genre this year is buddy comedy. All films will be available to watch online beginning April 13th, as will the awards ceremony May 9th. When I look at you lately, I just want to smash your face in. Smash my face. <laughs> Prepare for a new War of the Roses. The 1989 dark comedy starring Michael Douglas and Kathleen Turner is getting a reimagining. Benedict Cumberbatch and Olivia Colman are set to star as the ill-fated couple. Both are also producers on the film, with Poor Things writer Tony McNamara set to pen the screenplay and bombshell director Jay Roach behind the camera. Down the Your dad singing my song was one of my great moments in my life. Charles Fox may be the most successful songwriter you've never heard of. Killing Me Softly with His Songs looks at his wide-ranging work and how the Emmy and Grammy winner has influenced movies, television, and popular song. The documentary begins streaming today. Friday, he's due to be honored with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. KISS has sold its music catalog to Pop House Entertainment. Variety reports the Sweden-based music in investment firm also got the rights to the rock and roll group's image, name, and likeness, including their iconic makeup designs. Terms of the deal haven't been officially announced, but Bloomberg reports it was worth more than $300 million. Pop House is behind ABBA's Voyage hologram show. A few months ago, KISS announced plans for a similar concert with digital versions of group members. New music could be coming from Grammy-winning Grammy winning artist Billie Eilish. While neither the musician nor her reps have commented on the speculation, Variety reports billboards featuring Eilish's symbol have popped up all over the globe. The billboards also feature what appear to be new lyrics. Fans are taking note because Eilish used a similar tactic to tease the release of her 2021 album. That's it for what's happening in entertainment this week. Now it's back to Emily with the news. Thanks, Rachel. A suspect in Nashville's deadly Easter brunch shooting is now in custody. Authorities say Anton Rucker was arrested in Princeton, Kentucky, about 100 miles north of Nashville. He's accused of opening fire at a restaurant after an altercation, killing one person and wounding five others. People who were wounded have non-life-threatening injuries. Metro Nashville police said there is no indication the suspect and victim knew each other. Officers said Rucker waived extradition to be returned to Nashville authorities to face charges. Millions of Americans were impacted by severe storms Tuesday. Many parts of the country are reeling from dangerous tornadoes and damaging winds. Jen Sullivan tracked these storms and has details on the damage that this system caused. Winds so powerful, this student knocked to the ground at the University of Kentucky. The winds tearing down power lines, trees crushing cars in this Lexington neighborhood. An EF1 tornado flattening this building in Nelson County, Kentucky. Lexington did suffer significant damage this morning with trees down, roads blocked, traffic signals out. With more storms on the way, 
all of the bluegrass state now under a state of emergency. More than 75 million Americans from the Gulf Coast up through the Northeast impacted by severe weather and tornadoes Tuesday. Parts of Kentucky, Indiana and Ohio facing the highest risk. This is a dangerous period of time. This same system already tearing through parts of the Midwest, bringing tornadoes, damaging winds, flooding and hail strong enough to break through this car's glass in Indiana. In Chesterfield, Missouri, a tornado uprooting trees. These branches piercing through one family's roof and through their kitchen ceiling. You could see through the windows in the basement that something big had come down. The heavy rains triggering flash flooding. Several vehicles underwater in Rock Hill, Missouri. Rescue crews wading through the water and using a boat to save a stranded driver. The water came comes up so fast that he got stranded in her, so we had to rescue him by boat. The severe spring storms not over yet. Parts of the Midwest and Great Lakes could see a foot of snow by Thursday. While much of the northeast and south will see heavy rain. I'm Jen Sullivan reporting. In Northern Kentucky, NKU canceled all classes and events after 4.30 p.m. on Tuesday. Tuesday's storms were so strong, winds tore the roof off of an Ohio elementary school. Look at what's left of a classroom after storms hit Fairland West Elementary School in Proctorville. No injuries were reported. Parents in the district say all of the students are on spring break. The superintendent says the school will not be opening in the near future and students will be moved to other buildings. NKU Student Government Association elections took place last week. Lucy Burns and Colin Gerald were elected to the, be the next president and vice president of SGA for 2024 through 25. Burns and Gerald defeated their opponent, Tiana Raspberry and Brianna Hall by nearly 75 votes. Also in NKU news, the university has announced a new minor in veteran leadership. Aya Alili from the Northerner reported that the program is the only one of its kind in the region. The minor will consist of 21 credit hours and will be part of the history department. Rusty Martis, coordinator of the Veterans Resource Station, said veterans can convert their military training time into credit hours. This comes as NKU is recognized as military friendly with a gold distinction. And now we'll take it over to Jacob to hear about your upcoming sports break. Thanks, Emily. Cincinnati Reds baseball is back in full swing. UConn men's basketball is struggling to get to the Final Four and updates on NKU softball and baseball teams. These topics and more coming to you on the NKU Sports Break. I don't remember how it started. Start the bat. Our back and forth. It always came back. You probably don't remember what you told me. That was perfect. But I heard every word. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, you're my friend. I noticed you haven't really been yourself recently. Yeah, I feel like something's up. How are you? Are you okay? Is there anything you want to talk about? I just want to know how you're feeling. And listen, even if you don't know what to say, I'm here to talk. No matter what you're going through, I just want you to know I'm here. I've got your back. When you want to talk, I'm here. Welcome to the NKU Sports Break. I'm your host, Jacob Staley. The NKU Baseball won their last game against Miami Hamilton, winning 21-6. to 
They play Purdue Fort Wayne Friday at 3, Saturday at 2, and Sunday at 1. Their next home game is April 12th at 2 against Wright State. They are 19 and 9 on the season. The NKU softball played played a doubleheader and won both games against Purdue Fort Wayne, winning 6 to 2 in the first game and 4 to 0 in the second game. Their next game is a doubleheader against IUPUI Tuesday. The first game is at 2 and the next game is at 4. They moved to 14 and 11 on the season. A rough journey to Arizona for the University of Connecticut men's basketball team ahead of the NCAA tournament semifinals. The team experienced lengthy delays and mechanical problems with two of their planes. It all started on Wednesday when their original aircraft had mechanical issues. Then there were delays with the replacement aircraft due to weather in Connecticut and minor mechanical issues. That issue was resolved by an onboard mechanic and the team was finally on its way, arriving to Glendale early Thursday morning. The Huskies face the Huskies face the University of Alabama Crimson Tide at the State Farm Stadium on Saturday evening. The Cincinnati Reds beat the Phillies Wednesday night, winning four to one. With with their next game at next game Friday at Great American Ballpark, the New York Mets at 6:40. The next the the Reds are four and two on the season. And that'll do it for this week's edition of NKU Sports Break. Thank you for tuning in. Now back to Emily with the news. Thanks, Jacob. In nearly half of U.S. states, you'll need a six-figure household income if you want to buy a house. A new analysis from Bankrate.com found buyers need to make more than $100,000 to comfortably afford a typical median-priced home in 22 states and Washington, D.C. Analysts assessed affordability as whether mortgage payments could be made, assuming a 20% down payment with a 30-year fixed rate. They didn't factor in closing costs, home maintenance costs, and non-housing item costs, which all home buyers had to take into consideration. Breaking it down, places that need the highest household income to afford a typical home are California, Hawaii, DC, Massachusetts, and Washington State. Places that require the lowest levels of income are Mississippi, Ohio, Arkansas, Indiana, and Kentucky. And we talked about the upcoming total solar eclipse earlier, but a northern New York woman is gearing up for what she calls a momentous occasion in more ways than one. Benny Nizaj has her story. Dot Pelkey is originally from Altona and used to be a Georgia Pacific employee in Plattsburgh, but for the last 11 years, she's been a retired resident at Watson Memorial Senior Housing in Moores, and at 101 years old, she's still very active going on daily walks and socializing with her fellow neighbors. I get along with all of them. I can tell them all sometimes, but I get along with them. <laughs> I think. <laughs> Yeah, I love them all. They're all so good to me. Dodd will be celebrating her 102nd birthday on April 8th, the same day as the total solar eclipse, and she can hardly wait. I'm anxious. I'm, I, well, I want to live to see it. <laughs> I didn't want to live to my birthday. I want to live to see this. And I guess I'll make it. It's not too far away. But it won't be her first time experiencing the phenomenon. She remembers the last time something like this happened back in 1932. It wasn't a complete, it, this is going to be a complete one. The other one had a little bit, I wasn't very old, so, but I remember talking about it more than anything. And everyone at the retirement home is thrilled for the eclipse and her birthday to coincide. It's especially um, important for somebody who's going to be turning 102 on that day, <laughs> you know, so it was, it just seems very symbolic of, of the times. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and Dot is determined to see it. It's one thing of a lifetime. You know, you don't see that very often, so I'm trying to be here to see it. We wish a happy 102nd birthday to Miss Dot and hope she doesn't forget her eclipse glasses on Monday. Research says your crazy work schedule could affect your health later in life. A new study suggests working shift hours outside of a normal 9 to 5 schedule could lead to poor sleep, fatigue, and depression down the line. Researchers used data from more than 7,000 people in the U.S. using a basis of a standard work schedule from a start time of 6 a.m. or later, 
and ending by 6 p.m. The study found that people who took on a more volatile schedule outside those hours in their 20s, 30s, and 40s showed the poorest health by age 50. The study's author says new technology and an emerging gig economy has combined to produce non-standard work schedules for more and more people. The research was published Wednesday in the journal Plus One. And that will wrap up today's Norse World Report. Thanks for tuning in. You can find us on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Northerner Media, and at NKU World Report. Have a great evening. Catch us here next week. Stay classy, NKU.